because I was so inspired to be um, doing these videos that I had to make another one just in here. So everything has mass. Let's take the example of a campfire. And I was just telling my lady this the other day in one of our lovely long WhatsApp video conversations as we watch Netflix party together, check it out. It's a Chrome extension that allows you to sync up the videos on Netflix so you can watch together and you know type and chat with each other. But we also do WhatsApp video calls and we were talking about um, this, about uh, if the soul has mass. She was asking, do you believe the soul has mass like 21 grams? And I instantly said, no, absolutely not. But um, in, on the other hand, everything has mass, and so I would say yes to a uh, qualified yes. And the qualified yes is that everything has mass. So imagine a campfire with logs that weighed exactly 10.0000 weight units of your choice. Um, it was very well hewn and cut precisely let's say by robots, so you have this exact weight of wood. You set fire to this wood by jiggling the atoms on it so much by applying fire or, you know, heat, fire, you apply fire to the outside of the logs, and they jiggle so much that they begin to start to snap together with oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. And when they snap together, there's a chemical reaction that releases energy, and that is fire. So the, the flames that you see are like a glowing plasma of energy coming from the wood and oxygen reacting chemically, um, releasing heat. So it's the fire pyramid. What happens is, I was gonna say tetrahedron, that's why I paused. Um, the uh, energy that's released from the fire has mass. Um, so let's say the fire burned down completely. Um, it was a nice, beautiful fire, and it's now a fine, white, gray ash. Uh, no cinders or anything like that. And you weigh it, right? So it's 9.8 something mass units. All right, so it's mostly there. Um, now you get the smoke. From the fire, you have this perfect collection device. I know, you know, perfect, whatever, but it captures in this ideal, ideal scenario all of the particles of smoke that left the fire. None escaped, not a single atom of smoke or molecule of smoke escaped. And you weigh that smoke. Okay, so it's 9.999, nearly infinitely repeating, mass units. Okay, where's the rest of it? Well, the rest of the mass is from the energy given off as heat through that reaction that you felt and warmed your chest and body and face through infrared radiation and then conduction through the floor and convection um, in the air, I mean, moving through air currents to, to distribute its heat um, evenly. All of those methods radiated energy from the fire and that all has mass. So that's what Einstein meant when he said E equals mc squared. It's a really a much longer equation, but can be distilled into that very pithy, like inch long equation, which explains the universe essentially. It'd be nice to have another one of those. Um, right, so energy, the radiated heat from the fire uh, that you felt, equals the equal sign, uh, meaning equivalent to mass. Um, you know, stuff, times the speed of light squared. Uh, speed of light, I believe, is 386,000 kilometers per second. Um, and so that's really fast. Um, I believe it's uh, 196 million miles per hour. Don't quote me on that, I, I'm not sure. It's very, very fast. Um, and it really kind of doesn't matter how exactly fast it is. But we're, uh, I mean, not for our purposes anyway, but it really matters for the universe. Um, so E, energy, heat from the fire, equals mass times the speed of light squared. So that wood, that 10 pounds of, or kilograms or metric tons of wood, um, times the speed of light, 186,000 miles per something. And <laughs> um, 
is, is their equivalent. They're, they're equivalent. So it's just so um, so dense with energy uh, that that little amount of mass that we shaved off that you know what's not from the smoke and not from the, the wood itself, that amount of mass created all the energy that you felt or that the room felt um, and was latent in the rest of the room. Um, an interesting example, and I'll tie this into a thermostat, um, make kind of a dad joke. Uh, when you heat a house, it's more energy efficient to keep the temperature consistent throughout the days, weeks, and months within a few degrees. Let's say um, you had it 72 and you're going out for a while. Bring it out at like 68, 65, something like that. Um, instead of dropping all the way to 40 and turning your heat off. Um, or the opposite in the summer. If you have it set at 68 to keep it cool, I mean, you're going away. Don't just turn off the AC completely um, and let the room warm up because it has to do with some, something called a thermal battery. And a thermal battery means your walls, your couch, your floor, everything really heavy and massive soaks in the heat um, or expels the heat in the case of it being cool, because there's no such thing as cold, it's just absence of heat down to absolute zero. Um, and uh, so any, any heat you add above absolute zero is all, it's all heat, it's all energy, it's all vibration of molecules. Um, so heat is vibration and is transferred by phonons instead of photons, um, which is pretty cool, phonons are pretty cool. Um, but, uh, where was I? Right, thermal battery. Um, it's more energy efficient to keep it in a certain range. So the heating system doesn't have to work so hard to add more energy back into the walls that were released before. So, yes, the air in the room it may heat up or cool down fairly quickly, depending on the strength of your HVAC system. Um, but the walls and floor take a lot longer than the air to change temperature. And so by leaving off your heat or leaving off your AC for more than like a day, um, you give the temperature in the room, which is how long it about takes, like roughly, depending on the size and thickness and density of everything. Um, I don't have a timer on this one. It's not the front facing camera, so I can't tell how long I've been speaking. Um, let's just finish the concept. It takes a long time to um, discharge and recharge thermal batteries. So you're wasting money if you're um, you know, playing with your thermostat too much. That's why the Nest and stuff like that is um, more energy efficient, because if it controls the temperature accurately and doesn't let it swing too much with the right duration of time in between, then you save money by using the thermal battery effect. And of course, by having good double-paned windows, because windows is like where 98% of the heat in the house goes out of, especially poorly sealed ones. Um, just because it's like this thin veneer looking out to the outside world compared to like the rest of the walls which are insulated, ideally. Um, so yeah, that's thermal battery. Um, entropy. Entropy is really cool. There's something called Maxwell's Demon. So Maxwell's Demon, um, the principle is that um, system will always tend to go towards chaos, like the universe will eventually end in heat death because there will be not enough heat um, on one side and a differential of cool on another side to make work happen. So that's how all engines work. That's how, like, see, uh, uh, a steam engine works. It's cold outside and it's hot in the steam engine, so the hot air expands and wants to go outside. And when it goes outside and dissipates into the atmosphere, then the steam engine is able to have a difference again and make the heat to push the piston to then release the steam and then into the atmosphere and it heats up the atmosphere and then the steam engine cools down equivalently and then okay we're cool and we contract and then we add more heat okay it expands and then because the atmosphere is cool it it dissipates into the atmosphere and the engine contracts again it contracts is um, just a simplification of, of the in, engine, of course, it's a huge oversimplification of how an engine works, but it's pretty accurate in terms of physics. So, or extremely accurate for, for the purposes of my um, example. 
Um, so, you need a differential. If the atmosphere were to become the exact same temperature as the steam, or very close to it, in fact, there's a, it, has, it needs a large margin to work efficiently. But if, if the temperature of the atmosphere approached the temperature of the steam engine, the steam engine would cease to work. Same thing with a gasoline engine. The fire in the gasoline is very hot. Um, mixing with the atmospheric, uh, the gas mixes with the air and blows up and it's very hot and high pressure. Because it's high pressure, it expands and then is released into the atmosphere. Um, if the atmosphere were equivalently high pressure to the inside of a, a combustion chamber of a gasoline engine, then it wouldn't work anymore. Because there would be no differential uh, between the inside of the, the piston and, uh, sorry, the inside of the combustion chamber with the piston below and the the um, geez, I forgot what they're called, but the the uh, the exit points, the four uh, cams, I mean, uh, the four valves, sorry, valves that, depending on the sophistication of your engine, the number of valves, two, four, whatever, uh, allow the air to escape. Um, but if the atmosphere was the same pressure as the inside of the combustion chamber during combustion, the thing would not work. So it's differential. Back to Maxwell's demon. Um, because of this principle, everything going towards chaos is seen of as a law of thermodynamics. It's really more of a statistical certainty than a law. It's just because if you imagine um, a jar with a, um, an even temperature gradient in it, and you put a separation, a barrier inside the jar, and you have this Maxwell's demon who is so smart and so precise that he can move individual, or she can move, we're equal opportunity here, um, she can move the um, vibrating fast particles on one side, uh, rather, the more vibrating fast particles, because it, it's like a gradient, not everywhere in the, even if you have the same temperature, there will be a difference in between individual particles, you're taking an average of the system is how you get temperature. but. Let's say it's all equal, and he starts taking, you know, energizing, energized particles, the hot particles, over to one side, and the other side, and the other side, and the other side. And now you remember where all the particles are, and you remember where they were, and by moving them over, you now create this gradient. And through your knowledge, you have created energy where there should be none. Um, so this is this. Example of Maxwell's demon defeats the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and it's not necessarily a law, it's a statistical certainty, more or less. Um, so that's, that's a more accurate way of describing the second law of thermodynamics, that um, things tend towards disorder. And I may be colloquializing here, I'm not like academically trained by any means. Um, I'm just reading this and interested in this stuff as a passion, as a, as a hobby during quarantine. It's fun. Um, anyway, so yeah, uh, the, the actual energy, what Maxwell found out, which is very fascinating, um, is that the energy is from the storage and deletion of information from this demon, her brain. Like, um, the storage of information of all these particles, which are nearly innumerable, like, the size of atoms are unfathomable. Like, if you have a softball on the size of a, uh, in the center of, like, a, a football stadium, the nucleus would be the softball. So it's like protons, neutrons. Protons are kind of small, neutrons are, are bigger. Um, and you have a nucleus with made of protons and neutrons. And then you have uh, the electrons going on the outside. Um, so you have that softball in the very dead center of the football stadium on the field, um, let's say 50 yard line. And then you have the outer cheap nosebleed seats in you know, like your biggest stadium would be approximately where the electrons would orbit. Um, speaking of electrons, um, when you uh, add energy to a system, like you have a tungsten, you have a light bulb with a filament in it, remember those? Um, and uh, you heat it up, you make it glow red hot with electricity. Energy is coming into it. Energy makes the tungsten vibrate a lot. And um, <clears throat> it adds energy to the tungsten. And the, the electron orbitals, which means the, the path that it takes around the outside of the nosebleed seats, um, has to increase. Uh, because it needs to hold the extra energy somehow and, and still stay the same without like flying apart. Um, it doesn't really happen in the case of nuclear chain reactions. Uh, I digress. Um, the 
uh, electron must go farther out than the nose blade seats. It's like a drone orbiting around the stadium because it couldn't get in, and it shouldn't be there anyway, um, uh, to, to add the energy. But um, the light bulb needs to maintain a state of equilibrium, the tungsten does, and so the electron needs to give off that energy. Uh, sorry, the tungsten atoms and molecules need to give off that energy to maintain, um, I want to say homeostasis, but not the word for it. Um, and so it releases a photon in equivalent energy to the distance the drone drops closer to the to the stadium. So it's like the drone expended some energy, some battery power. That's not really a good analogy, but it's um, it's got it has to get closer back to the nosebleed seats. No no drone anymore. Back to the nosebleed seats because it gave off the photon because um, it was excited, and um, we excited the tungsten to create light by using the orbital um, of the electron, the orbital distance. Um, so this is similar to how planets work. So let's say we have the sun here, and uh, we have, um, what's really elliptical? Let's say Pluto, because there's a planet. Pluto is uh, going around the sun, and uh, as it gets closer, it moves faster, because there's this law, I think it's Kepler's third law, but don't quote me on that. I mean, you should actually kind of know this, but this is extemporaneous, so assuming. Um, so, uh, it goes around the sun, and as it goes farther away, there's a need for it to sweep out the same area in the sky. So let's say we drew a triangle um, in the in the orbit, like so we just like drew a line through it and then drew a line down, and there's like a certain uh, it's like a triangle um, surface area of that triangle, and the planet needs to move much slower out here. Um, in order to tr trace out the same surface area, let's say it's um, one square inch is popping to mind, so let's say that it's one square inch of this surface area shaded in this triangle around the sun, Pluto, sun, um, okay, and it's over one second. So one square inch over one second, one square inch over one second, one square inch over one second. Now it's so close to the sun, there's so little surface area for it to get in that one second, so it has to go far, it has to go faster. Uh, one square inch in one second, one square inch in one second, one square inch in one second. And then the surface area as it goes farther out, it's like, you know, it can go slower to get that one square inch per second. So that's supposedly, theoretically, maybe exactly how it works. So um, thank you, and I love you all, and thanks for listening, and have a great day.